Steph Curry delivered last night, dropping 20 points with 12 assists and a 127-100 Warriors win. This comes after a 27-point performance in Game 1 and that unforgettable 50-piece he dropped in Game 7 versus the Knicks. Look who's here. CJ McCollum. So good to see you. Good to see you, too. Um, all right, I'm going to start with you. Hey, Big Perk, we still got you? Yeah, I ain't going nowhere, Molly. Okay, right cool. Here. Hey, Pinky, you're back too? Okay, cool. Um, CJ, you've gone against Steph many times. Tell me this. Which Steph should the Lakers fear more? Pass first Steph or shoot first Steph? I think you fear shoot first Steph more, mainly because of how efficient and effective he can be. He, mm -hmm. proved, he proved that in game seven of the Sacramento Kings series going for 50. That was the most aggressive we've seen him in a yeah. long time, scoring off the bounce, scoring in isolation, scoring in pick and roll. I think you can live with him passing. It's just a matter of who he's passing to. In last game, he was passing to Klay Thompson, who was extremely hot. He goes 8 for 11 from 3, scores 30. Uh, the Warriors have an insane record. I think they're like 76 and 15 when Klay Thompson scores over 30 points, and that's including playoffs and regular season. See right here, Steph being used as a decoy, set the screen for Klay. Klay gets open. Steph's ability to not only draw crowds and, and kind of serve as a, a gravity, if you will, for their team, but his ability to score is, is something that is, is well known. But when he's passing, and he's passing to Clay, he's passing to Dre, he's passing to J. Michael Green, who was a, a, in, implemented in the starting lineup, I think that's when he becomes most effective uh, because he's using everything he has to offer in his game. But I would say that the shooting is what scares you most. And you live with J. Michael Green, you live with a lot of those other guys who are very capable yeah. of doing it, but they're not capable of doing it for an entire series. Thank Kirk? you, CJ. Thank you. I, I wish I had you on here a couple more uh, a couple more segments ago because I was I was just arguing about that. But it scares me when Steph Curry has the ball in his hand and he's being offensively aggressive looking for his shot. But the 12 assist Steph Curry, that's the Steph that I would rather take if I'm on the, on the opposite team. I would rather him dishing it out to, <clears throat> to others like Draymond Green to make those guys be scores and things to that nature because I believe I have a better shot at winning the ball game when Steph Curry takes only 12 shots in the ball in the ball game. So I'm going with the fear of Steph Curry shooting, and I'm living with him passing. Steph Curry is the greatest shooter that God ever created, plain and simple. And the fact of the matter is, is that when that brother – has the ball in his hands, and he's got a shoot-first mentality. I don't know if there's anything in the league that instills more fear than that. It is simple and plain. Shoot first, Steph Curry, all day, every day. Is that quick enough for you, Big Bird? Thanks. I appreciate it. Really? <laughs> Is that really what we're going to do right now? You're killing me. I don't, don't is this is this a petulant child moment cuz we're tired because it's you got it's, it's, you got it's, it's called absolute, out and now we're not no, going to fill the segment. It's no it's no petulance whatsoever. I don't have any problem with KP calling me out because he was absolutely right cuz I'm not going to lie to you. You don't hear me say this often. It's very rare that I've been as exhausted on television as I am this morning. I'm okay. tired as hell. You relax cuz you know what? Truth. You relax because you do yes. work very very hard. Because I got these two here. CJ and Perk got me covered. So, Perk, what stuff do you expect to see in game three? Well, the same stuff I seen in game one and game two. And, and Molly, look, I watch every show even when I'm not on it, okay? And first I heard take. CJ, yeah, first take and get up and all the shows. My TV don't turn off. Oh, I'm sure your wife really and, loves that, but carry on. No, she, she uh, actually yeah, yeah, but, she, but, but it is important to point out I believe you, but you watch nothing more than you watch first take. I just think oh, it's man. To say oh, man. Go go. But here, here we go. And I was watching CJ. Can can I can I request can I be Stephen A for a second? Yeah, of course. Can you put can you put CJ on the split screen with me? Yeah. You and should he's got watching. a great suit on. There you go. There you only go. Only one Stephen and I, A, but all right. Go ahead. It's only don't, one. St <laughs> don't start, man. Listen. Rest your I voice. heard C I heard CJ <laughs> talking about how basically the Warriors have the edge right now, and I got a problem with that. I got a problem with that. He knows good and damn well that a series that's 1-1, one -one, when the Lakers got one on the road going back home, the edge goes to the Lakers. And I just want to know if CJ, I'm going to give him an opportunity to change his thought 
and because he had time to think about it and come back and say, you know what, I was wrong, Big Perk. I shouldn't have said that on the get up because I don't know what I was thinking about at that moment. I just don't. I wasn't wrong, Big Perk, but I understand what you're saying. I think the moral of the story is after watching game one and game two, understand the Lakers did go in there and punch them in the mouth in game one and establish their dominance. AD was great, 30 and 20, looked fantastic. Schroeder played well. D'Lo played well. I love what I seen from them. And then I watched game two. And I watched the first half. The third quarter started. Son was already asleep. My wife was asleep. Shortly after that, I was asleep. I didn't watch the rest of the game because I seen what was happening. I seen the Lakers let go of the rope, understand that they're going back home for game three. And I went back and watched it again, and I seen how the Warriors won. And the way in which the Warriors won is sustainable for the long haul. They can win with shooting threes. They can win with playing fast. They can win with not shooting free throws. The Lakers can play fast, but historically they haven't shot the ball well from three. LeBron hasn't shot the ball well from three all playoff series. AD shot one free throw in game two. That's a recipe for disaster. He has to get to the free throw line. And I think the moral of the story is, although they did get one in the Bay, that was an impressive win in game one. It was very, very impressive. I think the way the Warriors won in game two showed me that with adjustments and ability to play J. Michael Green, the ability for Draymond to guard AD, he did a phenomenal job on AD. He made it very difficult for him. I think they can sustain the way they played last night and translate that into more victories, and I think well, the Warriors are going to win this series. That's just my personal opinion. Well, well, well Stephen, you tired, right? You tired, right? So sit over there and relax for a second. Yeah. Let me, let me say this to you. I, I strongly believe, CJ, that the Lakers fell into the Warriors' trap by shooting the threes, and they let them off the hook. I think LeBron, AD, Rui, they have to take their behinds down in that paint on the low block. I want to see more post-ups from LeBron James. Uh, who is more riding on them this series? Is it Embiid or Tatum? I think, believe it or not, it's, it's Jason Tatum. And the reason why I feel that way about Jason Tatum is because Embiid has an injury that he's playing with, and we always take that into consideration. His health being a factor, um, there are to some degree, there's just certain things that you're not going to hold against him because obviously these are not bogus injuries. He's been injured throughout his career. His first two years in the league, he didn't play a game. His third year, I don't think he like played about 51 games or so, missed about 31 games. This is what he's had to go through through his entire career, whether it's his foot or his knee or his back. We understand that about Embiid, and I think the fact that he missed game one, he was questionable for game two, but ultimately tried to play anyway, you're looking at it from that perspective. With Jason Tatum, there's really no excuse. Um, you look at a Boston Celtics team that's the reigning Eastern Conference champions. You didn't really lose anything. You added Malcolm Brogdon. Uh, obviously, that was a big pickup. Everybody likes that. Everybody sees what they are. You lost Ime Udoka, uh, but Missoula has done an outstanding job. I don't think anybody can deny that. Uh, so when you look at it from that perspective, it's about Jason Tatum and Jalen Brown. And I think here's the other thing that puts more pressure on Jason Tatum. Jason Tatum is the best player on the team. He is not the best player in the postseason over the last two years. And that has been Jalen Brown. Jalen Brown has been a more reliable asset for the Boston Celtics than Jason Tatum. And so when you look at it from that perspective, assuming that J J Jalen Brown is going to continue to do what he's been doing, you are going to look at Jason Tatum. They won the other that night by 34 points or whatever it was, right? Jason Jalen Brown had about 25 points. Jason Tatum had seven points. Now, it's not a big deal because they won the game. But as you reflect on this team, if they falter and fall, you're going to look at Jason Tatum and ask yourself, what did he do? With Embiid, you're going to say, was he healthy or not? Because we know what he can do when he's healthy. With Jason Tatum, you're going to be like, what did he do? And that's what we're especially piggybacking off to his performance in the NBA Finals last year. So I would say there's a little more pressure on him. Yeah, so I would say Joel Embiid here because one of the things is we just don't know what's going to happen with James Harden in the offseason. He's an unrestricted free agent. And there's a couple of things to point out here. The, the Sixers lose an advantage in free agency on Harden because they're not allowed to sign him for five years. They run into the over 48, over 38 rule, and so he can only get a four-year contract, and he can only get a four-year contract somewhere else. Not that I'm advocating you give him five years at this point, but that's a factor. It's been very loud. Woj reported on Christmas Day that, that Houston is really wants to get him back. They have cleared salary cap space. They intend to do it. I don't know what's going to happen with James Harden. I don't think anything's been decided. 
but it's uncertain. It's absolutely uncertain. And so the Sixers have the best team they've had in the Embiid era. And I agree, Stephen A., his knee is not right, but he is also playing through it. He went and got a procedure to try to get back. He's, play, he, he's openly said, I shouldn't come back. It's four to six weeks. I'm going to come back now. He's doing that because he realizes the chips are down right now. And if, if Harden walks, it's not like, oh, we have 30, 30 million cap space. We'll go sign another player. That's not how the team is structured. So I think whoever wins this series is going to have a great chance to get to the NBA Finals with home court advantage. And whoever loses it is going to have some real issues to deal with. Thanks for watching ESPN on YouTube. For live streaming sports and premium content, subscribe to ESPN+. Plus.